This is the third video in a series of three, so if you haven't already seen the first two, I suggest that you begin with those and then come back to this one because we're going to be referring to some uh, information that I talked about earlier. So, before string theory rose to scientific stardom, the most popular unified theory in town was supergravity, which was basically supersymmetry plus gravity without the string. Like any respectable quantum gravity candidate, it boasted a surfeit of space-time dimensions, in this case 11. The compactified ones all wrapped up neatly on a tiny little seven-dimensional sphere. Unfortunately, it had to be abandoned because of the problems I mentioned earlier involving point particles and string. But then along came M-theory. Still under development, it carries the hopes of many that it will combine the various flavors of string theory soup into one single satisfying broth. The cost of this, in conceptual terms, is the addition of a single dimension. M-theory is 11-dimensional, but with the unusual trait that it can appear 10-dimensional at some points in its space of parameters. Supergravity rides again, but this time with strings attached. And the M in M theory? I didn't mention in the previous video that while strings with their one-dimensional extension are the fundamental objects in string theory, they're not the only objects allowed. String theory can accommodate multi-dimensional entities called brains, that's B-R-A-N-E-S, with anywhere from zero that's points, to nine spatial dimensions. A brain with an unspecified number of dimensions p is called a p-brain. In M-theory, with its extra dimension, the fundamental object is an M-brain, which resembles a sheet or membrane. Like a drinking straw seen at a distance, the membranes would look like strings since the eleventh dimension is compactified into a small circle. Building a theory of everything is one thing, testing it is quite another. The physical conditions that have to prevail for the four forces of nature to be unified into a single force haven't existed since the universe was about one ten million trillion trillion trillionth of a second old there's not the remotest chance of recreating that kind of environment in the lab anytime soon, if ever. But what physicists can do is look for other clues that their unification scheme is on the right track. I said in the second video in this series that supersymmetry predicts that there are supersymmetric fermion partners of all the force-carrying bosons. The supersymmetric partner of the graviton, for example, is a spin 3 over 2 particle that, like all its supersymmetry cousins, is expected to be very massive, maybe a thousand times more massive than a proton. This high mass has put the creation of such particles beyond the reach of accelerators thus far. But that might be about to change. A new generation of more powerful instruments, which started with the Large Hadron Collider, is coming online, capable of exploring the energy domain in which the new particles might be found. Evidence for supersymmetry at high energy would be compelling evidence that string theory was a good mathematical model for nature at the smallest distance scales. In some ways, the invention of string theory was premature, its physical concepts running ahead of the mathematical techniques needed to describe them. One of the architects of string theory in its modern form, Edward Witten of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where Einstein spent his latter days, has said, By rights, 20th century physicists shouldn't have had the privilege of studying this theory. What should have happened by rights is that the correct mathematical structures should have been developed in the 21st or 22nd century, and then finally physicists should have invented string theory as a physical theory that is made possible by those structures. Then, the first physicists working with string theory would have known what they were doing, just like Einstein knew what he was doing 
when he invented general relativity. There are other theories of quantum gravity besides string theory. One of the leading rivals is called loop quantum gravity, founded in the late 1980s by Abhay Ashtakar of Penn State University, Carlo Rovelli of the Center for Theoretical Physics in Marseille, France, and Lee Smolin of Harvard. Its strategy is to focus on quantizing the space-time of general relativity without getting involved in trying to unify gravity with the three other forces. Smolin, however, has suggested that string theory and loop quantum gravity might eventually be reconciled as different aspects of the same underlying theory.